in this freezing cold Monday morning. Can you imagine saying these words from South Florida? Freezing cold Monday morning. For you it's summer, for us it's winter. I'm missing my, my scarves and gloves, I'm, I'm done. Anyways, today, the 22nd day of Shabbat, corresponding to the 24th day of January. Today's class, graciously de dedicated by Mark Kreisman and family for the entire week. La'ayud Nishmat, his beloved father, Eliezer, Ben Beracha Esther, Vehaim Abraham Yehuda, Alav Shalom. Additionally, today's class, graciously sponsored by Alan Beda and family, Le'ayu Nishmat, our dear friend and member, Mr. David Herdel Towell, and David Ben Polin, Alav Shalom. In addition to the words of Torah, both in Shamot, Havan Aliyah, in Gan Eden, Amen. So we begin this week's Torah portion, Perashat Mishpatim. Perashat Mishpatim, interesting enough, we can say that is the first perasha of the Sefer Torah that contains a large amount of misvot. Ben Adam la Makom, Ben Adam la Havero. Some misvot in our godly relationship, and some misvot are into interpersonal relationship. Interesting enough, the Torah, Torah, and I'm using this statement as a springboard for the Gemara class of today. The Gemara, begin, the Torah begins with a peculiar misvah. The misvah of a Jewish slave, a Jewish servant. How does someone become a Jewish servant? First of all, you cannot just become a Jewish servant. You have to commit a crime. You cannot have the means of paying back the victim of your financial crime, then the Bedin will capture you, will sell you as a slave, and with that money, we're gonna reimburse the victim of your crime. That is the background of Eved Ivri. Additionally, interesting enough, not every person that was able to afford to buy a Jewish servant was allowed to purchase him as a slave. Let's say you have the money, right? Rabbi, I want to buy Tal Nidre for $100,000. You need to be ready that I will say to you, let me think about it. And not because the money is not good, but I need to make sure that the one that's going to get it, it's a person that don't have issues in their background or issues in their marriage, etc. I bring this example because when it came to purchase an Eved Ivri, the owner, the buyer, needed to be almost a Sadiq. Actually, the Gemara gives you a warning on that. Mishe Kana Eved Kana Adon Le if you bought yourself a Jewish slave, you bought yourself a headache. <laughs> you bought yourself a master over you. But that, that means a headache. You know what it means? The Gemara brings a few examples. One pillow, he gets it. You cannot tell them, okay, go have rice, a cereal and milk for dinner, and you have a succulent rib steak. What he eats, what you eat, he eats. You go to Florida vacation, you bring him. That's what the Gemara says. You bought a master over you. Because you must treat him mamash in a good way. And the Torah, just to clarify this for the record, in Judaism, the concept of jail system doesn't really exist. There is something called a holding cell but not jail system like today our society has. Also in Israel, there is a jail system. But back then, there was no jail system. Why? Because I think that we all agree that jail system is not a foolproof system. And if you read sometimes about this topic, 
they, some people do get rehabilitated. At least I know that in Israel, definitely this happens. In America, it also happens. I'm talking about Jewish inmates that happen to be in Jewish cells. There's a jail system today in America that they have three minyanim a day. They have daf yomi. Sure, kosher food is nothing to be happy about. It means that if they have a three minyanim a day, means that there are at least 10 Jewish people in the jail. Mm. Yosef Sadiq was an exception. You can bring, Yosef Sadiq was part of a godly system of bringing Yosef. I'm talking about us, regular people, you know, from everyday life. But your point is excellent, but really Yosef, it's a major leak uh, of why he was in jail. But in a different note, the Torah believes that a person has the potential to be rehabilitated if the person allows that to happen and if we have the right mentor for that to happen i remember many years ago uh, and this is a personal experience which i'm going to share with you now i wasn't always a rabbi yes i've been a rabbi for 30 years but there was a chapter in my life that God says, before you activate your rabbinate, I need you to get a training elsewhere of the Jewish system. Go work for the government. I can't display much information publicly. For obvi I cannot tell you. <laughs> don't, don't force me, because if I have to give you answers, then you have to act. So I will keep it that way. Really? No, 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 no. I can't, I can't. Bottom line, part of my job description was to help people get back on their feet. And one day, I think it didn't happen often, one time, a fellow uh, brings me a folder, a folio, a folio. He comes out, he came out of jail, and I see that he left jail, went back to jail, left jail, went back to jail. So I asked him, I don't understand. Jail life is not the ideal. Why don't you take advantage now? God is giving you another option, another chance, another opportunity to become a productive member of society. You know what he tells me? Rabbi, I, he didn't say me Rabbi, he said Joseph. Okay, he says, sir, I believe in what you are saying, but guess what? When I'm in jail, I don't have to worry about health insurance. I have access to a full-time membership in a gym. I'm fed three times a day. I have free dental insurance, medical insurance, library, and everything else. I go out, they look at my rap, and my, and my, and my, and my page, and they see release from jail, etc. People say, we'll let you know. This was a true experience that I experienced in the year, I'll tell you right now, I came to Miami in 1988. 78. Must have been 1990, give or take, a few years back. But I understood that God had a plan for me. Because from these few years that I worked there, doesn't mean that I wasn't involved with the community. I was, but in a much more limited spectrum. And once I did my tikkun after four years there, so then God opened for me a lot of different doors. But I learned a lot about people. And when I mean people, I don't mean people that we see three times a day in the synagogue, Shaharit Minhan Avid. People of all walks of life, of all sources, of all religions, of all beliefs, of all, all mamash, from so many different backgrounds. And I cherish that great experience that I had. So going back to the parasha of today, so I think that I gave you the introduction to what the Torah expect. If you want to go ahead and purchase a Jewish slave, you need to be able and capable of being his mentor, sorry, of being his mentor. You need to be able to mentor him in order for him to develop the potential 
that God gave him as a human being. Every person has a potential. We just need to polish it and to bring it to the surface. That's in explanation number one. Number two, from all of the misvot of the Torah, is this the most fundamental misvah of the Torah? No. This misvah only happens in Israel, only in the time of the Sanhedrin, which is the time of the Beit HaMikdash, and only for those individuals that are righteous enough that they will be approved by the Bedin to purchase. It's like you want to buy an apartment, right? In the real estate business, right? Is it automatically approved that you're going to get a mortgage? No. And even if you apply for the mortgage and the bank approves it, is it guaranteed that the condominium association is going to approve you? No. So even though you have the money, you got the mortgage, you got a clear title, you can afford the monthly payments, suddenly the condominium association may say, no. Believe me, I have to deal with some cases in the past year. And why sometimes they say no? Attitude. Not transparency in their behavior. So, if that's the case, why the Torah begins describing the laws of a Jewish slave when you can pick an easier mitzvah that is applicable always and is applicable all over the world? So I think that we need to describe, to explain rather this pasuk in a much deeper level. I'll explain this pasuk and the next one in a minute. The pasuk writes, "In begapo yavo, begapo yese." If the slave came into the master as a single person, he lives as a single person. But if he was married, when this individual achieves freedom, which is usually after working for six years, then he will go free with his wife. One detail that I failed to mention before. The Jewish master that purchased this Jewish slave was responsible for supporting his family. Yani, now you adopted a new family. Can you imagine now? You have a chadame, and you're going to pay for the rent, the food, the tuition, health insurance. You understand how difficult it was for someone to become a master of a Jewish slave? I'm not going to go further into the Pesukim because we have a whole week to discuss this interesting misvot. But let's explain this misvah in a different way. So let's start from the second Pasuk. In Begapo Yabo, Begapo Yese. The word Gapo. That means single. But the word gapo also means gufo. A person comes to the world a combination package. We are not just a body. We are a combination of a physical aspect of life and the spiritual aspect of life. Our mission is what? to combine both of them and make sure that they have a good, loving, proper relationship. The body functions in a way that is suitable for the spirit and the spirit, the neshama, encourages the body to act in a physical way which is according to our Torah. So the Torah may be saying to us as follows, in begapo yavo, begapo yeseh. If you came to the world, begufo, meaning to say, the main goal and purpose in your life is materialism. That's gufo. Gufo means goof. Body means materialism. That's what it means. So, in begapoyabo, begapoyese, if you came to the world and your main goal and purpose in life 
was luxurious lifestyle of the rich and famous, and you ignore your spiritual side, Vega Poyese, your body leaves the world, and that's the end of the story. You have no legacy, <coughs> excuse me, you have no Shem Tov, you have nothing that can justify your presence in the world. And what I'm saying now is a bit heavy. A person needs to ask, ask themselves, what is the legacy that I'm leaving behind in the world? Don't answer that question. You need to answer that question. What difference did you make in the world? And don't tell me, Rabbi, I pay taxes. Because everybody does that. Even post-mortem, by the way. But don't ask me about it today. I'm not kidding you. I'm not kidding you. Check the Shulchan Aruch of the tax code. You'll see it black and white. So what did you do in the world? You came, you lived, you made money, you supported your family, your children. What else did you do? Did you leave a legacy behind? And a legacy, I don't mean a dedication in your name. That's a different story. If you need help with that, talk to me afterwards. I help you. Perpetuity, right? Important. But in a more serious note, did you make a difference in the life of people? Some people can say, for sure. Some people can say, I need to think about it. But what happens after? And that's what the Pasuk says. In Ba'ali Shahu, but if you are married, what does it mean married? There are two levels of marriage in life. Don't get ideas now. But there is such a thing in a Kabbalistic perspective. The marriage to your wife is your physical slash spiritual relationship. But then you have your private marriage with your neshama. That's why the Pasuk writes in Perashakiti, when a husband will have two wives. What does it mean that the husband will have two wives? Is the Torah, thank you so much, Sadiq, is the Torah guaranteeing me that I'm going to have two wives? I'm going to tell you a secret. Every married man has two wives. Ladies, don't worry. The second wife doesn't take money. There is no Ali money. There is no child support to be paid. God forbid, it's not of the outcome of an illicit, illicit relationship. It's imperative that I clarify this. I don't want anybody then to cut and paste what I said. And he says, every husband has two wives. For those who like to watch it via YouTube or Facebook, or, or, or I guess in the Ma'id Kol Hai that there are two wives in the life of a man. Ahad Ahuba, Beahad Senua. The wife that you love and the wife that they back up. Or maybe not really like. So, what does it mean, the wife that you like and you love and the one that you don't love? Short answer. One refers to your wife, the lady. The holy Jewish will a lady who walked with you to the chuppah. That's called a huba. That's your beloved wife, your spouse, the mother of your children. Beautiful. But then we have wife number two. Who is that? You, don't, you didn't know that you have one? Okay, don't talk because your wife will be listening to this soon. And then she'll say, it wasn't my husband, Rabbi. So we protect your identity. True story, by the way. Anyways, you know what it refers to? To the neshama of the person. So now it says, in Ba'ali Shahu, if you came to the world and you develop a good relationship with your neshama, ishto your neshama will escort you to Ben Eden. You follow now? This is heavy. So I needed to give you something heavy due to the cold weather outside. So I need to warm up the neshama. So far, so good? Yeah. I'm going to control myself, not saying too many more secrets, because it could be problematic for some of us. But let's go now to the first pasuk. We 
we, every one of us, how are we called? Amen Hashem. We are soldiers in the army of God. Although Ebed Hashem means a servant of God. Sometimes you see great rabbis when they sign or when they have a letterhead, they have the letters Ein He next to the name. One could be Amhaaris, Ignoramus. Another one could be Alav Shalom, may he rest in peace. And the third one, Ibn Hashem, a servant of God. Now, Kitigne Ibn Ibri, Sheshanim Yaabod, Uba Shibi'id Yasilah of Shehinam, this Pasuk refers to Shabbat. Six days a week, we work very, very hard. On the seventh day, we go into freedom mode. Although rabbis work hard every day of the week, and Shabbat I do triple shift. True, true, but I enjoy what I do. So for me, Shabbat is too short. If there is another shift, probably I'll do it. Okay? But it says, a person comes to the world. You understand? You are connected to the physical world for six days. On the seventh day, Remove the physicality to experience your freedom as a Yehudi. So now that we understand these two Pesukim in a different way, it makes a lot of sense. The first Pasuk is about Shabbat, the importance of Shabbat, even though the Torah says Shanim or Shevei, doesn't matter. The Shesh is the highlight. Six days of the week and on the seventh you rest. Shabbat is one, now we need to decipher what's your mission in life. It's your mission. The physical aspect of life is the materialistic aspect of life, or my mission is to combine both worlds. And the short answer is to combine both aspects of life. A hundred percent spirituality and zero materialistic life is no good. A hundred percent of materialistic life and zero spirituality it's not good. But when you have a combined effort between one and the other, we are in the right direction. As the great Baal Shem Tov says, that God blesses the person with physical and financial well-being, and the mission of the Yehudi is to elevate it. Which this brings me to the, the Gemara of today from Masechet Shabbat. Interesting enough, the Gemara of today quotes an interesting part of our daily prayers. We know, I'm giving you the short version of the Gemara, and it says, I read the Gemara first, and then I'm going to read from the Siddur. The Gemara discusses the value of actions. We know the British High brings this down in the loss of proper conduct in business. That's what the Benish High brings it up. He says the Pasuk, chapter 121 of the Hilim, Hashem Silecha, Aliyad Yeminecha. God is your shadow on your right side. What does that mean? Basically, the Benish High says that a person needs to understand that every action has a reaction. If the action is good, the reaction will be greater. If God forbid the action is not good, so the reaction will be in a negative way. And the same thing is written about marriage, although the topic of marriage is not today, but the same way. You talk to your wife one way, you show a present face, a, a, a happy face, etc. That will be a reciprocity. As says, The way your face portrays to the water, the water reflects it back to you, so happen with interacting with people. So I'd like to read first the Gemara, and then we're going to go to the Mishnah that is part of our daily prayers. And the beauty of this Gemara and Mishnah today from Masechet Shabbat first and then Masechet Be'ah is to illustrate to me, to us rather, that Misvot Benefit of Mizvot comes in different packages. 
Sometimes the person does a mitzvah and Hashem reciprocates immediately with the beracha, and sometimes the person does a mitzvah, and later on you see the dividend. So comes the Gemara and it says, there are six things, says this opinion in the Gemara, that a person does the mitzvah and immediately will see a benefit in the physical world, plus after 120, Olam Which one is this? Achnasat or him, welcoming guests, that we learn this from Abraham Avinu, Bikur Holim, visiting the sick. Today, unfortunately, with COVID protocols, people are a bit more hesitant, but definitely you can pick up the phone and call a friend to say a blessing or a prayer or to wish him or her a refuah shelema. Ayun tefila, the kavanah that a person puts in the prayer, beashkamad beta kneset, and coming to the synagogue early at for the minyan, beamekadel banah v'litalmud Torah, and the person that raises their children in the ways of the Torah, behadan et havero legav zechud, and the person that gives the friend the benefit of the doubt. This is one opinion in the Talmud. The Gemara says, stand a shoyer. Wait a minute. I have a Mishnah in Masechet Pe'ah. Mishnah preceded Gemara. The way it goes is Mishnah first, then Gemara. At the end of the day, the Gemara is an explanation of the Mishnah. So we find a Mishnah, and this is part of our daily prayers. You should know this by heart. But I'll repeat it just uh, to help everybody here. Right after the Akedah, there is a Mishnah that says, Elu de Barim Shelahim Shi'ur. These are misvot that the Torah did not give us a limitation, a measurement. For example, Pea. Pea, since we're talking about Masechet Pea, I explain very quickly. There is an obligation from the Torah, a biblical commandment that every person who owns a piece of land in Israel, many misvot need to be fulfilled for the needy. One of them is to leave a corner of the field for the poor people to come and to collect food. And that's part of your blessing. Because when you help the needy, you have guaranteed a return. But the Torah doesn't say, leave a corner of your field. How much is a corner? Does it mean a hundred lineal feet? Or it could be five lineal feet? Or maybe you have to leave the entire side. The Torah doesn't give us a number. Number two, Bikurim. Remember Shavuot? The people came to the Kohanim in the Bet HaMikdash and they brought a basket with the seven species, right? Mm -hmm. So now how much those products you must have in that basket. Do you need to have one of each? He says one of each. Other opinions say seven of each. Interesting enough, the Torah doesn't give you an amount. You want to bring one of each? You want to bring three of each? You want to be five of each? Hazak Kovaru. For the record, the Talmud says, you're going to laugh about this, that the reason why that a person today can fulfill the Mizrah of Bikurim you know how? I'm not going to say it to you. Because it has to do with the rabbis. It's okay. No, I'm not looking for... No. I'm not looking for gifts. No. What's Bikurim? Bikurim means the first fruits. Like Bechor. You know Bechor? First. Firstborn? Yeah. So before you benefit from your field, you need to be thankful to the one that made that deal to happen. So you go to the Kohanim and you give them a tray with the seven species of the land of Israel. This mitzvah was usually done during the time of Shavuot. That's why Shavuot is called Yom HaBikurim. Now, the third one, Re'ayon. You came to the Bet HaMikdash. You cannot come to the Bet HaMikdash empty-handed. Imagine yourself, somebody invites you to a Shabbat meal. Are you going to go empty-handed? I 
correct? Mm -hmm. Or you're going to bring a bottle of wine, you're going to send flowers, or you pick up the phone, and he says, okay, what would you like me to bring? Okay, bring a dessert. Hazak Ubaluch. It's a mitzvah from the Torah that says, Velo yera'u panai rekam, you cannot come see Hashem empty-handed, ish kematenat yado. You do according to what you can. You want to bring a sheep, you want to bring a lamb, you want to bring a veal, you want to bring an ox, you want to bring a cow, according to the blessing that Hashem gave you, we leave it up to you. Next. Gemilut Hasadim. Performing act of kindness. There is no minimum and there is no maximum. I think that we all do Hasadim in a way or another throughout the day. Okay? So there's no say, okay, I did two act of kindness today, I'm done for the day. No. There is no limit. But also don't keep it low. Do. Daily. Betalmud Torah. Is there a limit how long can I talk? Yes, I have a limit. Because I gotta make room for the next speaker in itorah.com. But that means, but that doesn't mean that we cannot continue learning. Go to the Kolel upstairs, you're going to see learning going on, studying in a few minutes. Okay? So there is no limit. You cannot say, okay, I fulfill my obligation one minute a day. No. The more you do, the better. So far, so good. Come the Mishnah now, and then the Mishnah says, hold on a minute. I have an additional listing of commandments that there are two benefits for the person. The benefit in the physical world and the spiritual benefit. Comes the Gemara and it says, Kivud al ba'em, the Mizvah of honoring parents. We learned this yesterday, towards the end of the class. In one way, it's a beautiful Mizvah to do, but it's also a very challenging Mizvah to do it properly. And let's clarify. Honoring your parents is not limited only to supporting them or talking to them. It's also the way that a person honors their parents. You don't sit on their chair. You stand up when they come in. You go up to the Sefer Torah, your father, or your father-in-law, by the way. The Lachach is very clear on that. Because thanks to your father-in-law, you have your wife. So you cannot say, I don't like my father-in-law. Even if you don't like him, husband Shalom, you should never say this. God forbid, because you're hating your wife. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, mother-in-law neither. Relax. <laughs> I know her. She's a wonderful lady. Okay? That's why you're happy every day. Okay? Thank God. Now, next, the Kibula Ba'em yesterday we learned two parts during the time that they are alive and during the time that they are no longer among the living. Since I discussed this in yesterday's class, I don't want to go further. Gemilut Hasadim, I also discussed this yesterday. The difference between kindness and charity. Next, Bikur Horim. The Gemara mentioned this before. Ahnasat Orhim. Beautiful. Welcoming guests. The Gemara already said before. Welcoming guests. Kashkamat. Okay, Kabbalat Bnei Shechina. The Gemara writes concerning Abraham Avinu. Remember Abraham Avinu? On the third day of the Milah, God came to check on the well-being of Abraham. What Abraham Avinu says, God, please, 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 please. Do me a favor. Go to the side. I got to take care of the guest. And we know the end of the story. Continues the Mishnah. See, this is something that we discussed recently. We go quickly. Mishkamat Bet Hakneset. Coming to the synagogue early in the morning. That doesn't mean that we're going to cancel all the Minyanim. Or we're going to have only Vatikim. No, we're going to have all the Minyanim that we have. But the idea is that a person does not run late to the synagogue. Whichever Minyan you're going to pray, Try to be there before the minyan starts. Believe me, 
אל חטאי אני מזכיר היום, חטאתי, עמיתי, פשעתי. It's something that a person needs to work, and I'll tell you from personal experience, the tefillah is way different when you started together with the hazan, than if you're just catching up and taking shortcuts. אוקיי, ברוך שאמר, מזמור לתודה, אשרי על אלוקה אשתבח. אוקיי, הלכיק לי, that's binding. You gotta catch up afterwards. The way the Benishai says, sometimes people skip part of the prayers because of their coming late. It says, but if a person wants to have the complete package of the fila, when you finish praying, say whatever you did not say before, or whatever you have to skip in order to say Shema, and Amida with the Kahale. It goes the Mishnah further, and the next two ones are not so easy, but they are also good. Bahaba'at shalom ben adam lahavero, uben ish leishto. Making peace between friends and making peace between husband and wife. Now, that doesn't mean, let's clarify, that the peacemaker between husband and wife needs to be a third party. Between friends, you can definitely be a third party involved and try to make peace and try to come to a certain kind, kind of agreement. But when it comes to marriage, you should try to work it out without external help. But if a person needs external help, there is no shame in asking for help. Because at the end of the day, if a person reach out, I like to work better with my wife, with my relationship, etc. That's beautiful. Why? Because it shows that the husband and the wife, hopefully, will like to preserve the sanctity of marriage and try to build the potential that Kadosh Baruch Hu uh, gave them. But yet comes the Mishnah, quoted in the Gemara of today, Betalmud Torah keneged kulam. But the learning of Torah supersedes them all. What does it mean? that a person should not say, why don't you come to learn? Oh, because I'm doing Mikur Halim, I'm doing Akhanasat Kala, I heard that there is a funeral, has the Shalom, so I'm gonna go. I heard there is a Milah in another shul, so I'm gonna go with Sauda, so I skip 40 days of fasting. Oh, I, I heard that there is a wedding in the afternoon, I'm gonna go dance. Yani, every reason, a hedge. You have an excuse, why not to come to learn? And that's why the Lacha is clear. If the mitzvah, a mitzvah needs to be done, if the mitzvah can be done through others, you don't have an obligation to run. If it's a mitzvah that is a temporary lifetime, maybe you're allowed to, to go. But other than that, when you have your learning, stays fixed. I deal with this often. And you know me already. You know how many brises and bar mitzvahs I miss in purpose. What does it mean in purpose? I tell the person, I have a date every day, 9.15 with all of you. Once I finish, then I go. I'm honest from the get-go. I say, Rabbi, what time are you coming? Maybe 10.15. I know, too late. The Mila is called for 9 o'clock. So don't keep Eliyahu and Navi waiting, haram. Okay? But I need to make a calculation. I need to make a calculation. Do I go to a Berit Milah that is something beautiful, but I'm not a Sandak, it's not my grandson, that at least I have some emotional obligation to be there. Okay? You invite me out of love and out of kavod, and I love you for that. But if it means that we're going to cancel our class, for me, is exactly what this Mishnah of today. I'm not saying that, God forbid, sometimes could not be emergencies. And that's why I always, if I go out of town, what do I do if I go out of town? You're recorded in the remotely car. in the car. How many times you saw me many in the car? Times. Yep. Many times. Because I know that I have the steady, you know, people who, for many, could be this, this source of Torah learning throughout the day. And if I'm not here, we ask one of the wonderful uh, rabbis of the Kehillah to come and to give uh, some words of Chizuk to everyone. What time is it now? 10 or 5? Okay, I think that I'd like to say one more thing with your permission. Thank you.
Thank you so much. You're so kind. I know why he's kind. His name says it all. We don't want to say your name publicly, Matchaf. Okay? Matchaf. You have a holy name. Don't sell it. You know, sometimes people sell the domains, the website domains, right? And sometimes they get paid good. In your case, don't sell it. Okay? Beautiful. Today's Musar talks about how problematic is for the person to be sad. Sadness. We already know the benefit of happiness. We discussed this topic a week ago. One of the many was the topic of happiness. We know how great is happiness. Today the Musar goes to an extreme. We know the benefits of happiness. Let's see the detrimental effects of sadness. Not only that, kvetching. Have you heard of this word? You never heard of this? Kvetching means only, oh, always a sign, always a complaint. Complain, right? Kvetching, complain, could be the same thing, right? Huh? Yeah, oy vey, uli. Sephardic people say uli. Ashkenazic say oy vey. Whatever you say is basically a negative connotation. A negative connotation. And the Musar of today says, that that affects the person. Emotionally, spiritually, and physically. And we know this. How many times, God forbid, we hear people affected by depression and they cannot function. They cannot live with the, with the gift of life that Hashem gives that person. And that's what it says here. It says, guess what? When a person acts in this way, it's like feeding the poison in their neshama. Because the Yeserara, says the Musar of today, looks for customers to inject them with this virus. This virus is called depression. Although today when you say the word virus, you have Delta, Omicron, I think, whatever, Delta, uh, Delta Force, no. Delta Rona, Flu Rona. Every other week we have a different name. Has Shalom. I hope and pray that by Isat Hashem uh, things will be behind us uh, very quickly. Amen. 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 But it says that the, the, let's say that a person commits a transgression. Okay? One Avon. Even one Avon is too many. But you know what Atzvut does? Brings down the person as a whole. It affects the brain. It affects the learning. It affects the functionality as a human being, as a person. And additionally, what the person wants to do? Mebalbel hamoah. The brain of the person, the mind of the person, is dancing all over. You remember we learned a few weeks ago, and we quoted uh, the Ramak, the Moshe Cordovero, that he writes, be careful with your mind, because your mind can be your biggest friend or your worst enemy. If you put in your mind positive, happy, pleasant, good thoughts, it has a domino effect in a beautiful way. But if God forbid the opposite, the opposite also has a side effect. And not only that, then it brings laziness. One of the common symptoms of depression is what? The person has no strength to do anything. Never heard of this? Mm -hmm. A person stays in bed, a person cries for no reason. A lot of emotional reactions do happen. This sounds like a psychology class. <laughs> But it's the Musar of today. Okay? And it's free. You don't have to pay a therapist when you go to talk. Okay? You have, you, 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 the Torah is telling us. And it says not only that, but people don't realize that sometimes there is argument at home out of nowhere. 
Where that came from? So it says here. <laughs> Look to the left and right. Mizeh nimshach ma machloket bebeto shel adam al lo davar. You have no reason, but your emotional state of mind is so down or so shattered that anything causes an explosion. God forbid. And then what happens? That type of personality, sooner or later, is noticeable by others. Not only your spouse, not only your children, but your circle of friends. What they start doing, taking a step back. Why? Because the person becomes impossible. In the sense of everything is Tisha Be'av. And Tisha Be'av is one day a year. Hashem, or even less. Not only that, God says, I'll come back later. I can't be with you. Where do we learn this from? The Gemara writes, Ena shechina shora lo mitoch atzvut, lo mitoch asvut, lo mitoch kaas, lo mitoch lesanut, ela mitoch simcha. Godliness cannot pay a visit to the person or godliness cannot dwell if there is laziness, sadness, anger, mockery, but happiness. You want to attract Hashem, happiness. Easy Gemara in Masechet Benachot. And the reason why the Zohar Kadosh is because one of the names of the Shekhinah is Simcha. Mm -hmm. One name of Hashem is Shabbat. Another name is Shalom. Another name, the Zohar Kadosh is Simcha. But Simcha, the Gemara says, Shel Misra. Meaning to say, you are happy for a good reason. Mm -hmm. Happiness is not called when you watch something that is funny and you started to laugh. Okay, laughter is external. Happiness is emanates from within the person. And it says not only that, the person that acts in this way that always complains. But a person, I'll make it easier, a man or a woman that looks at things in a dramatic or negative way. That shows many root. What's Merirut? Bitterness. Bitterness. Bitterness in the life. And that's why the Shekhinah says, you know what? I can't be with you. If you're going to act this way, I leave. I leave. And the truth of the matter is, do you want to be exposed to someone that is negative? and complains, I'll tell you something about me. I cannot stand pessimism. You know what it means? Negativity. Negativity and I, I cross the street. If you're going to be negative around me, you can't last working next to me. You will not last. Because I can't stand it. Baruch Hashem. My teachers train me well. That includes my parents. A good example like you and other wonderful members of the community. Thank you. So it says, not only that, it says that the, I'll finish with a very powerful statement from the Rebbe of Kotsk. He says as follows. Happiness is a misvah from the Torah. Actually, if you look in the Torah, you will find the word Simha or Sameah a few places. Mm -hmm. For example, something that the ladies love to hear is about the obligation of the husband to make the wife happy. It's a pasuk in the Torah. Mm -hmm. It's not a commentary. It's black and white written by Moshe Rabbeinu, mm -hmm. the Simah and Ishto. You must bring happiness to your wife. Mm -hmm. Today is your wedding anniversary? Okay, so since you said it publicly, 
uh, will take the opportunity to wish you and your life for many years more of happiness, of love, of acceptance, of, of affection at all levels. Needless to say that you're preparing something special for her today. And don't tell me, Rabbi, she has me, it's enough. Okay? I know that answer. I know that answer. But, you know, he said, whatever she wants. But can I say, can I give you a secret publicly? Nobody denies that you tell your wife whatever you want. But I think that in a day like today, you need to go out of your way. Go to one of the stores. I help you if you want. I help you write a card for your wife. And you'll sign it and you'll write it, but I tell you what to write. And even though the card may cost you five to ten dollars, whatever, but the fact that you went out of your way to do something for her, and you put took the time and you wrote it, believe me, she says, I love it, I don't need anything else. Because one of the reasons that we learned this last week, that many, many times in a marriage, materialistic and high maintenance and financial demands happen is because there is an emptiness or a void in the emotional chapter of life. And I don't mean physical. She doesn't need the true Lord. But maybe she will ask you for it. That's a whole different story. But I'm going to tell you, for sure it helps. For sure it helps. But you guarantee that when all these other departments are there, you'll see how life will improve. Which uh, Baruch Hashem, I believe that you have a good life, Baruch Hashem, good kids, and God, and that doesn't happen automatically. So keep it the good work. I'd like to hear a report tomorrow. What did you do for your anniversary, okay? You gotta check the list, okay? <laughs> Maybe chocolates, flowers, cards, Tomorrow's dinner. Okay. okay, beautiful. Find the time. Even just call her, it says, she's here though, right? Okay, so now to call you, see her in person. Anyways, so the, so Rabbi of course says, happiness, it's part of the Torah life. Sadness is not really written in the Torah. But if you remember Perashat Kitavo, the Perashat writes, after the Torah gives us the 98 warnings, that will happen to the Jewish people. We read this in the summer. What's the reason these calamities did happen? Tahad, due to the fact that you failed to serve God with happiness and a good heart when you have the opportunity. That's why the Rebbe of God says that sadness can bring down the person worse than the worst transgression of the Torah. Transgression is a transgression. It creates a spiritual blemish. And that's one. And that's why he said the Musar of today, one of the favorite weapons of the Yeserara to unplug the person spiritually is depression, negativity, sadness, stress, when really it doesn't exist. And this is what our emunah and bitahon needs to become activated. Remember yesterday we learned the prayer about challenges and suffering? And we say, Hashem, this is happening out of your own uh, desire and it's for my own good? Believe me, the words of the Torah, even though they may have been written many, 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 many centuries and even thousand years ago, the Torah doesn't become obsolete. Maybe an iPhone 7 became obsolete. You can no longer found it. You know, analog cell phones, whatever. But the Torah is eternal. And the Torah moves along with the time that a person lives every day of uh, their life. My dear friends, I wish everybody to have a beautiful, beautiful day. Enjoy your stay. And we say, Miskelam is God to the Graysmen and the Veda family for graciously sponsoring uh, today's class. Baruch Adonai Amen, amen.